today we have to confront a very real problem. It is impossible to define precisely what Two-Spirit experiences was. Although most people know, agree that such an individual existed, the particular of that identity remains for the most part a ghost. So, Indian residential schools, 125 years of sexual violence by male adults on children. So, homosexuality, violent sexuality, 125 years. So, as we come into the 70s, 80s, and 90s, where people both of both genders coming out as homosexual becomes a difficult issue in our community for a while because of the violence attached to it. As much as we've been colonized, we've colonized our own people as well. Right? Through generation, we repeat the history. So, and not to acknowledge two spirited people is a form of colonization. So, when I'm growing up, nobody wants to be known as a homosexual. It's one of those really horrible stereotypes that people put on you. Um, in my work as a psychiatric nurse, on the Tony side, I remember one person, um, and this is an awful story, so I have to premise that. Beautiful person, um, tall, beautiful, dark skin, very gentle, but you know, uh, homeless. She'd come into the drop-in and to take care of her basic daily needs and to eat some food and all that. And she was always talking about how home was always welcoming and she wanted to go back home. So I helped her, you know, and I got her some, uh, but we had to go back to her home and once in a while we get an email back saying she's doing okay. She eventually passed away from HIV and what we found out at that time is that her nation didn't accept her. So what they did is they rented an apartment for her out the reserve. So she died alone. A lot of two-spirited people end up alone a lot of times. So, over the last 20 years, we've been coming to grips with it like everyone else. What's happened in our community is we have found a really wonderful and pleasant way to not only describe, but to educate ourselves about it. The modern two-spirited people think it's only based on sexual orientation. Some of the traditionalists are opening themselves up and saying, yes, it existed, but it's based on gender identity and roles. And so both are clashing and we have to try to merge them together. <coughs> so while on paper this looks nice, let me tell you something. <coughs> 18 years ago on Sawatu Nation, an elder came and took my drum away because I was two-spirited. And so I would normally send you away, but I can't because this family accepted you here. And I think that the word two-spirited allows us to open up our minds, what hooks in our language. 
Wach hooks means to open. Wach hooks and squallowing means to open our hearts and our minds. So we're opening up and our understanding now is different from people in my age group and previous generations. So we are very understanding and now, haven't been in the past, but now more supportive because we understand we're shedding that, that fear. That Fear <coughs> Society started as a group in 1993. Um, 1993, I had just graduated as a psychiatric nurse out of Douglas College and I had a hard time finding jobs. <laughs> so I created a not-for-profit organization called the Harris Project Society, which received money. And out of that, we were servicing um, transvestite transsexuals that were both native and non-native, that were sex trade worker and IT drug users. And we had received a huge grant over five years to deal with the issues and to try to help and service the, the community. So out of that um, came the vision to actually really center on um, Aboriginal people and help the Aboriginal community, in part because I am also Aboriginal. And so the group was formed then called Dancing to Eagle Spirit, which is part of my name, <laughs> my traditional name, right? And, and so we met, we had elders come in, did a lot of traditional teachings over a five year period. Then the society lost its funding and it split between Dancing to Eagle Spirit Society and the Hires Project. So the Hires Project reinvented itself and I helped them get more funding from the ministry and Dancing to Eagle Spirit Society decided it was not not going to go after funding but was going to focus solely on spirituality, cultural norms and healing that between non-natives and natives. Um, as a result, in 1998, Dancing to Eagle Spirit became a registered not-for-profit organization. And in 2006, it applied to charitable status. And in 2010, it applied at the federal level to have to be recognized as a religious organization, not elsewhere classified. So it's a religious organization under the norms of the Religious Act of Canada. So. That has been my vision, that's how I move the leadership and the people towards that. Now it's very strong, it's well recognized, it's well established. The younger generation like yourselves are way more open and learning that it's not harmful to anybody. That what happened in Indian residential schools and the sexual violence, that that's a different, very different. So in our community, we're finding a way, we have found a way to understand it and shed our fears and our ignorance about it. So, but we're working really hard at it. 1971, I was 11 years old. I marched on Parliament Hill in Canada as a boy with my placard saying, we demand our rights. The law had just been changed two years prior to that where they decriminalized homosexuality. 1974, I marched on Parliament Hill with my little placards because they're arresting gay, lesbian, and bisexual people. 2010, I was invited to the Whistler Village to do a welcoming on the traditional territory for Pride House Whistler Olympics. First time in the Olympic organization. 40 years before, I was being arrested and chased. 40 years later, they asked me to come and bless the welcoming. In my lifetime, I have seen the changes. With one voice, two voice, you had three voice, you had four voice, you had five voice. Your voice matters. What you hear today and how you're going to change your attitudes tomorrow and in a year what you're going to do with it is what's going to do the changes.